So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Carolyn Rachel with us today, um, and not just today, uh, he's all week, definitely, and a uh, few more days as well. Uh, you may want to take that as well. Um, so Carolyn got her PhD in 2020 uh, at Arizona, where she worked with Fergal uh, Ozell, where was supported by an NSF fellowship. In 2019, she got the prestigious prize, prize uh, of Ohio State. And now she's at Princeton, when, where she holds uh, a record high three simultaneous affiliations with the uh, IS, the PCTS, and the uh, Gravity Initiative, all at Princeton. She's an expert of uh, equation of states of dense matter and how this can impact uh, gravitational wave signatures. And that's what she will be talking to us today. Karen. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, let me uh, fix that mic on my back. So uh, well, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, thanks very much, Lena, for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to share with you all some of the things I like to think about, uh, including how we can look at the properties and interactions of very dense matter using observations of binary neutron star mergers. Uh, so it goes down. Okay. You look at the screen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Can try. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Like How's that? Better? And I'll just try and speak out. Let me know if I. Okay. So I know we have a very broad audience uh, in this uh, uh, podium today. So I want to start um, by hopefully having this work. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I want to start by highlighting some of the many reasons why neutron stars present a very interesting physical laboratory to try and study. Um, and so, as you may know, neutron stars are formed during the core clump supernovae that mark the deaths of very massive stars. They're characterized as having masses between one and two times the mass of our sun, so on the order of some 10 to the 33 grams. Um, and this incredible mass is compressed down into an object that has a characteristic radius that's on the order of 10 kilometers. And so it's a high compression fraction. Uh, means that neutron stars contain the densest matter of the surface that is found anywhere in the universe. In addition, what is very high compression factors, neutron stars are, of course, governed by very strong gravity. They usually think about extremely high magnetic fields, reaching up to some 10 to the 15 gauss. These objects can also rotate extremely rapidly. The fastest of these uh, neutron stars can spin with uh, rotation frequencies of several hundreds of times per second, which is faster than your typical just blender. <laughs> and they can have their in the room. There's also some interesting properties they might take encounter in nature than neutron stars that are a little more exotic than what we have encounter on Earth. So, for example, the inner crust of the neutron star contains a mixture of a superfluid. A mixture of superfluid neutrons combined with a crystal lattice of heavy nuclei embedded in between, which is a naturally forming example of a super solid. And then the, the, the very core region of the neutron star uh, contains high temperature superconducting protons uh, that are, have temperatures in excess of a billion Kelvin. So, for a wide variety of reasons, neutron stars give us an uh, uh, interesting laboratory to study a variety of physical questions. Um, as the title suggested, though, today I'm going to focus primarily on the fact that neutron stars contain very, very dense matter. And so, to illustrate the densities of interest I have on the uh, right here, I uh, think here's like a cross section, a cartoon cross section of what uh, the neutron star interior looks like. So, from the very outer layer of the neutron star, you have a crust that's made up of heavy nuclei embedded in a sea of relatively thick electrons. As you descend deeper into the interior of the neutron star to higher density, the neutron then becomes increasingly neutron rich. At density of around 10 to the 11 grams per cubic centimeter, you encounter what's called the neutron grit density, when uh, additional neutrons in the very saturated nuclei start to leak out of the nuclei. And this is what forms this, this super fluid mixture of uh, neutrons. And this then even deeper into the interior of the neutron star, at around half of the nuclear density, the nuclei have become so saturated that they can no longer remain bound uh, and they dissolve. And you have a phase transition to a uniform mixture of neutrons, protons, and electrons. 
This forms this outer core region of the semi-cone sign interior. Um, a higher density non-linear saturation density, which I want to list here because this is a number I'm going to be referencing throughout my talk as a convenient reference point. Um, so this is the density of a typical atomic nucleus is around 2 times 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter. But that density is beyond this nuclear density uh, that the bulk of the matter within the neutron star lies, um, and where a theoretical understanding of what happens to the matter uh, starts to break down. And as a result, there are a wide range of theoretical predictions for what the state of matter is on the innermost core region of the neutron star. For example, some theories predict that the innermost core of the neutron star is characterized by just plain nuclear matter, so neutrons, protons, and electrons. Other theories predict you can get the emergence of those Einstein condensates, so pions or aeons. So other theories predict you can get the emergence of strange stuff in the form of hyperonic matter or some phase transitions within a deconfined quark matter or a color superconducting quark matter. So differentiating between these different theoretical predictions for what the end stage of matter is at these very high densities is one of the main motivations driving this line of research that I'm going to describe today. And so when it comes to coding the properties of very dense matter, there are a few different ways you might think about that we might be able to uh, move forward or to the species. So this is just showing a few of these beta grams and the temperature as a function of the density. With additional access drawn on, showing the neutron excess coming outside of the cage. And so, when it comes to terrestrial based laboratory experiments, for example, uh, studies of finite temperature nuclei, for example, from these uh, low energy nuclei nuclei scattering experiments, or images with experiments like the relativistic heavy ion colliders, these types of experiments are probing uh, matter up to and around the nuclear saturation density. But critically, in these types of experiments, at least in the current generation, are also probing matter that is fairly isospin symmetric, meaning that it has relatively equal numbers of protons and neutrons compared to what you would expect to find in the core of the neutron star. The neutron star can occupy this really distinct region of the parameter space to the far right here, where they have central densities that reach some six to maybe eight times of nuclear density. So they're significantly more dense than what we can probe in laboratory based settings. Um, and of course, as the name suggests, they also can vary neutron rich matter. Basically, all equations of state predict that at least at some densities, the matter in the neutron star interior exceeds 90% neutron fractions. So, extrapolating from the conditions that you find in these terrestrial based experiments to the, the, the constraints you find in these terrestrial based uh, experiments, the types of conditions you expect to find in the neutron star interior involves a lot of uh, extrapolations. And this is part of why. The equation of state of the constant matter remains uh, relatively unconstrained at high densities. And so I would argue our best way forward is constraining the properties of matter in this particular part of the parameter space are through observations of neutron stars directly. And of course, here I'm going to focus on this new window that we have into the neutron star interior through the detection of gravitational waves from binary neutron star mergers. Okay. So this is just showing a, a basic anatomy of a neutron star merger. To this group or in terms of the different regimes that I'm going to be talking about in today's talk. So on the top is showing the gravitational wave strain that you expect from a set of merging neutron stars um, as functions of time. And the bottom are snapshots from the corresponding simulation that made this prediction. I'll come back to this simulation later on in my talk. So starting from when the neutron stars are well separated from one another, uh, they are slowly orbiting each other, orbiting each other. But because you have a time varying mass quadrupole moment, this increases gravitational radiation and causes the neutron stars to start to spiral into one another as they become in, as they become closer together. They become increasingly tidally deformed, and this process continues up until they come into contact with one another. As you have a violent and turbulent merger phase. And following this merger phase, depending on the mass of the neutron stars that merge, and their chance of remnant on the will immediately collapse to a black hole. But it's not quite so massive, you can get at least a temporarily stable massive neutron star remnant that can survive for some tens of milliseconds to potentially longer time scales um, following the merger. And so in this scenario where you have a massive neutron star remnant left over, this object is going to be uh, rapidly rotating and non axially symmetric. And so as this object relaxes down to some equilibrium configuration, uh, it's going to work down and continue to an entire frequency post merger gravitational waves. So this slide also serves as this rough outline for what I want to talk about today. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to review uh, what we have learned so far from either of the mergers that we've detected to date. 
some of the lessons we learned and what we might expect to learn uh, in the near future with similar type of events uh, coming through. And then in the second uh, part, two thirds of my talk, I'm going to discuss what additional physics we might be able to learn from future detection of these higher frequency post merger gravity radiation. And what we're going to make that kind of throughout the talk is that everything that LIGO has been detecting so far um, from merging neutron stars has come exclusively from the uh, in spark gravitational waves, which I can see even by eye here are lower frequencies where the current detectors are a little bit more sensitive. The second part of my talk is kind of a more forward looking uh, approach to what we may be able to learn uh, in the coming years as we look forward to testing these higher frequency gravitation waves. All right, so uh, of course, as you probably have seen before, we're just really excited to hear now uh, of gravitational wave astronomy with a total of four online detectors. Uh, so these include the two U.S. LIGO detectors, which have been online more or less in their current capacity since 2015, subject to upgrades. We're joined in 2017 by the Italian detector Virgo. Um, and in just the last month of the last observing run, uh, in March of 2018, the Cogram detector, which is an underground facility in Japan, all came online and joined this network. Uh, they're currently all online, I should say, uh, under my upgrades that will hopefully be turning back on at the beginning of 2023. And this network of gravitational wave detectors has observed roughly 100 compact object mergers to date, which are summarized in this so-called stellar graveyard diary. If you're not used to looking at the plot, the horizontal alignment here is arbitrary. The vertical alignment just shows you the map of the two objects that merge together. So every pair of points that's connected to the parallel corresponds to one compact object merger. So you can see here that for the vast majority of compact object mergers that have been detected to date have come from binary black holes. There's a small and growing number of events that contain at least one neutron star. And these are the ones, of course, that we're most interested in for proving the properties of dense matter. I have included a number of excited births. So the very first event, which I'll come back to in a moment, was event GW7017, which is this incredibly lucky nearby Signal noise burst event. So, we're looking at a special electromagnetic counterpart in the form of the and then, uh, yeah, burst. There's also since been a second binary neutron star merger. However, this event was a little bit farther away. So, we have less strong constraints on the properties of the matter within the neutron star from the system. And there have been a couple of other interesting firsts, for example, the first neutron star black hole and the first detection of a so called mass gap object. Um, where based on the gravitational wave alone, it's not necessarily clear, but the heaviest neutron star that's ever been detected or the lightest black hole that's ever been detected. But in the process of constraining the dense matter equation, okay, most of our information still comes from this first neutron star merger event. Uh, and when it comes to the gravitational waves, do the inspiral, the primary way in which the equation of state is encoded in that signal is a parameter of the neutron star tidal visibility. Which is just the quadrupolar response of any object, the tidal potential of its binary companion, multiplied by the line. This parameter depends sensitively on the equation of state. Okay. So I have a simplified two play out in the bottom uh, of this slide, showing you these intuitions of how the visibility parameter maps back to the equation of state. So very roughly, imagine you have some simple holotropic model for the equation of state, which is a special reflection density. If your equation of state predicts uh, it's relatively stiff, meaning that it predicts a high pressure at a given density, this has to pop up the mass distribution of the neutron star. Uh, and in the scenario, the outer layers of the neutron star. Uh, the audio is not to as well. Okay. Uh, trying to hold this closer, and I will try to. Okay. Uh, so, anyways, uh, if you have a relatively stiff equation of state, it's going to act to puff up the mass distribution of your neutron star. Uh, so the outer layers of the neutron star mass distribution are going to be slightly more susceptible to the gravitational pull of the binary companion, and this starts to be characterized as a high tidal deformability parameter. In contrast, if you have a softer equation of state, the overall mass distribution of the neutron stars will remain more compact. You have smaller radius neutron stars with a smaller tidal deformability parameter. The way that this is encoded in the gravitational wave signal is that as you increase the tidal deformability predicted for your neutron star, um, this, uh, the, the tidal deformation acts to effectively drain some of the orbital energy from the orbit. It acts to accelerate the wind spiral, leading to uh, neutron stars that merge sooner than would in the absence of tides. And so if you can track out enough of these in spiral 
uh, prior to merger, you can uh, measure this phase of evolution, which is directly then proportional to the tidal deformability. And in this way, you can place this on the tidal deformability parameter. So we can see that actually measured uh, from the event GW17. So first binary neutron. On the left here, you can see the gravitational waves still look like. This is just showing the, the frequency of the gravitational waves as a function of time up until merger. Um, and this is was detected for the last 30 seconds prior to merger, um, which corresponds to the roughly the last 3,000 orbits of the two neutron stars uh, prior to when they merged. And so from the phase evolution of that signal, uh, the LIGO Virgo collaboration was able to place constraints on this tidal deformability parameter, which is shown in the right here. Uh, okay, so this is still not really. Um, I don't know if that was better or worse. Yeah, there, there are room mics that capture the audio. All right, so I think I should just keep it all the way down. So I'm not sure I'll just try and speak up. Can, can you hear me okay about this? I'm ready. Okay, so uh, I'm going to switch it off. Switch it off. Um, wait, so, so to give you a sense of scale for this tidal deformability parameter, uh, this that binary tidal deformability parameter can range anywhere from values of up to a few thousand, which is what you'd predict, predict for big peppy neutron stars, down to values of zero, which is the theoretical expectation for a black hole. The vertical bands in this figure are showing the uh, theoretical predictions for a small number of different uh, theoretically calculated equations of space. And so right off the bat, you can see already that this binary tidal deformability parameter <laughs> measured. Okay, good. Uh, the, this tidal deformability parameter that was measured for <laughs> is on the relatively small side compared to what could have been theoretically predicted, indicating that the neutron stars that merged in the system were relatively compact. Uh, and in fact, we can map this more directly to the properties of the stellar structure. Uh, and there have been a uh, but now my <laughs> advancer is not working. There we go. Okay. Uh, there have been a large number of studies that have mapped these constraints on this tidal, deform this tidal deformability back directly to constraints on the neutron star radius. And here, when I mean the neutron star radius, I'm not referring to the, the deformed radius or the radius prior to merger. This is an intrinsic property predicted by the nuclear equation of state. So every equation of state makes a unique prediction for what happens. Um, and so this is just showing you some of the many estimates of the neutron star radius that were inferred based on this tidal deformation parameter using the kinds of qualitative arguments I just made, um, but done more quantitatively in these mappings, subject to the kind of assumptions in all of these mappings. Um, all of these different types of analyses, while they differ in the assumptions that went into them, uh, they all are roughly consistent in that that predicts that the neutron star radii were relatively small. Typically, these analyses find that the radii, uh, the neutron star radius must be less than around 12 and a half to 13 kilometers. I'm going to focus in particular on the one uh, estimate that I was involved with, um, where we find that the neutron star radius is less than about 12 and a half kilometers at 68% confidence based on this one event alone. Now, part of why it's incredibly, I think, useful to map these constraints back to a neutron star radius is because one of the main goals of the neutron star equation of state community for the last decade or so has been to measure the neutron star radius, primarily using X-ray observations. Um, and historically, this has come mainly from neutron stars in X-ray binary systems, where you have some accretion onto the neutron star, and then you can spectroscopically measure the neutron star radius either during a bursting phase or when the accretion goes into the X-ray. So this figure is also showing in the gray dash line a summary set of those dozen or so X-ray radius measurements that we had at the time that GW1707 was detected. And what you can see here is that there is, I think, a remarkable agreement between these two completely independent methods for measuring the neutron star radius, that they're both pointing towards small values uh, for the neutron star radius. Uh, the astronomers in the room will also know that there have been uh, more recent X-ray data coming out from a different type of X-ray experiment from NICER, which models the pulse profiles on rapidly rotating neutron stars, um, where they have measured the radii of two additional sources, where the error bars here are a little bit broader than the composite measurements shown here. But again, these measurements are still roughly consistent with what we're finding in the gravitational wave event. And so I think these kinds of multi-messenger comparisons 
are going to be incredibly powerful moving forward as we get more data with each of these different types of experiments to allow us to check for systematics between these different experimental methods um, and, and to really do a robust check of uh, all of the model uncertainties that go into these constraints. But for now, to the level that we are able to constrain them, they're roughly consistent with one another. Okay, uh, and so finally, I just want to show what the constraints from GW 1717 look like directly now mapped back to the equation of state parameter space, where these constraints are going to be done in a fully Bayesian inference type scheme. So uh, this is just showing pressure for function of density, and each of these colorful lines corresponds to the theoretical prediction of a different um, model for the equation of space. So these incorporate different degrees of freedom in the interior or different calculation methods for uh, actually calculating the interactions between the particles. So these are the constraints uh, that were uh, made from GW 17 and light blue. And then in dark blue is that previous set of constraints that we had at the time from those X-ray radius measurements. And again, you can see here in equation of state parameter space um, that these two methods for measuring the equation of state are roughly consistent with one another. However, I want to emphasize here that there's still a relatively large uncertainty. There are a lot of theoretical models that you can draw in between within these error bands, right? This is uh, still a, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of room for improvement. And I think over the coming years, uh, there is a reason to expect some moderate progress towards further constraints on the equation of state. So for example, this next observing run that the LIGO uh, collaboration is gonna embark on will start in early 2023. And it's detected that in this next observing run, they might detect another roughly 10 or so neutron star mergers. Um, some of which will have hopefully high enough signal to noise to enable additional constraints on the tidal deformability. And then we can start to stack our statistics and get better constraints here. And it's been estimated that with a few tens of events, we might be able to detect the constraint the pressure at twice nuclear densities to within a factor of two or so, which still gives us, however, some room for improvement. So now for the rest of the talk, I want to discuss some of the other ways we might think about constraining the neutron star equation of state using uh, future detections of these higher frequency post metric gravitational waves. And in particular, I want to focus on how these uh, future detections are going to complement what we're learning now from these in style gravitational waves and these measurements of tidal deformabilities. So this is sort of my, my mid-talk outline, uh, but the, the central question uh, that's going to motivate this, the second half of my talk is going to be how can we use observations of the post-merger phase of gravitational waves to further constrain the equation of state. And there's going to be two parts to this. And the first part, I'm going to talk about the impact of uh, finite temperature effects, so thermal physics, on the post-merger evolution. And then in the second part, I'll discuss some of the ways in which we can use these post-merger gravitational waves to probe the structure of the remnant neutron star object. Okay, so a key difference when it comes to studying the post-merger phase of a binary neutron star merger um, is that this requires numerical simulations. So whereas for making a prediction for what the tidal deformability or the neutron star radius is that's predicted by a particular equation of state, to make those kinds of calculations, it just requires solving a simple set of ordinary differential equations that I can calculate many times per second on my laptop for many different theoretical equations of state. In contrast, now if I want to make the uh, a prediction for what the equation of state signature is going to be in the post-merger phase of a binary neutron star merger, um, we need these more involved uh, simulations, which simultaneously solve the Einstein equations coupled to the equations of relativistic ideal magnetohydrodynamics. And so basically what this allows you to do is to dynamically evolve the space-time as you're also modeling the uh, fluid of the neutron stars during this merger. And you can imagine these are, of course, highly coupled systems, because as you change the space-time, this affects the matter distribution, and as you change the matter distribution, this affects the space time. Okay, so these types of simulations are necessary for making any sort of predictions about what sorts of observations you're going to get, um, basically from the last few orbits prior to merger, through merger, and for the first few tens of milliseconds after merger. And so these are going to be important for making predictions, for example, about the dynamically launched ejecta that's squeezed out and launched as the two neutron stars merge together which is one component of the overall ejecta that's available to um, feed the electromagnetic counterpart to one of these events. Of course, these simulations are also necessary for making predictions about these post-merger gravitational waves and for more generally modeling the dynamics of the post-merger evolution um, and making predictions, for example, about the lifetime of the merger remnant, um, at least for these, these first uh, tens of milliseconds after the merger. 
The other key difference uh, from what we were able to learn from the in-spiral is that the post-merger gravitational waves are actually probing the equation of state in a fundamentally different part of the parameter space than we have access to with observations of the in-spiral. In particular, the post-merger gravitational waves are probing the equation of state at finite temperatures. So from relatively soon, at least astronomically speaking, after a neutron star is formed, it cools. And so for the vast majority of the neutron star's life, it is thermodynamically cold by which I mean that the average energy of the particles is much lower than the local Fermi energy. And this is in spite of the fact that on the first slide, I've told you that the central temperatures were a billion Kelvin. This is th still thermodynamically cold for the extreme density that characterized the neutron star interior. And so this approximation of the neutron stars being at zero temperature applies not just to isolated neutron stars, but also to neutron stars during the in-spiral portion of one of these mergers. Uh, and in fact, it holds, as I'll show you uh, in a presentation in the next slide, basically up until the point at which the neutron stars come into contact with one another, at which point there's significant shock heating that can raise the temperature of the system to some tens of MeV, at which point thermal effects can become important and might potentially influence the dynamics of the post-merger phase. So whereas the constraints that I showed during the first part of the talk were described simply by pressure as a function of the density, which is appropriate for a zero temperature equation of state, to model the, the post-merger evolution we need to uh, we mean models for the pressure as a function of density, temperature, and potentially also the electron fraction, um, because the composition can also vary away from its initial equilibrium state composition, although I won't focus on that part as much today in my talk. And so we saw already that there's large uncertainties in the, the cold equation of state. There are, additional, uh, there are additionally significant uncertainties in the finite temperature part of the equation of state. And so I'm going to summarize things with you on the right here. Well, this is showing the thermal pressure relative to the cold pressure predicted for uh, a set of uh, finite temperature theoretical equation of state models that have been calculated and are commonly used in the merger literature. So you can see here that already at nuclear density, there are differences of three to five times in the thermal pressure support that is predicted by these different equations of state um, for matter that's fixed at the exact same temperature. Um, and so this is another source of uncertainty that we might be interested in trying to model or understand how these uncertainties are going to map to uh, the, the dynamics of the post-merger evolution. And so what I'm going to describe in the next few slides is a phenomenological approach that I use to try and understand the, these uncertainties. Um, and in particular, what I adopt in my research is a, a, a basically a series expansion-based formalism for constructing the equation of state. So basically, uh, I decouple the cold equation of state from the finite temperature part of the equation of state. And then for the cold equation of state, we can take basically uh, any cold equation of state that we want, something that's predicted by nuclear theory, uh, a model that would be constrained, for example, by the tidal deformability or radius measurements that I showed you in the first part of the talk, or something as simple as some piecewise polytrope that just let you step through some interesting part of the parameter space that you might want to try to explore. Um, and then we're going to add on to this uh, a phenomenological model for the thermal pressure so that we can uh, maybe systematically start to explore these uncertainties in the finite temperature part of the equation of state independently from the uncertainties in the cold physics. Carolyn? Yes. Could you go back? Yes. So, well, I would think that as n goes to be much less than the saturation density, the thermal part would be understood. But it looks like your curves, the dispersion is just as large. So yeah, is that just, that's not low enough density yet? Exactly. Yeah, so still here, um, there are still some differences at, at these densities. At, at much lower densities, yes, they should, you expect them all to give more or less the same answer. Um, so you agree that you're using the same percentage. Um, but yeah, at, at tenth saturation, you still see some differences. Okay, so the model for the, the thermal pressure, um, looks something like this. So this is actually uh, one of the uh, the thermal pressure function as a, as a function of density predicted for one of those uh, theoretical models for the equation of state, I showed you on the previous slide, just to highlight the different regimes of interest that we want to try and capture. Um, and so, of course, our, our goal here is to create a, a parametric model that includes all of the physics across these different density regimes. Crucially, we want to make sure that we're including the effects of degeneracy, which become significant at high densities, where the bulk of the matter within the neutron star lies. And so if you consider basically at sort of intermediate densities, the thermal pressure can be well modeled as an ideal fluid. Um, so just pressurizing that from KT. 
At higher densities, as the matter starts to become increasingly degenerate and some of the available free energy of the system goes into those interactions between the particles, this leads to a characteristic dip in the thermal pressure um, and a suppression compared to what you would get based just in the ideal fluid based approximation. Um, so the, the goal here is to come up with a model that captures this density dependence. Um, and this is just a, a note for the experts in the audience that the, this is in contrast to the hybrid approach, which has been used um, since the early days of merger simulations to approximately model um, finite temperature physics. Um, but we're moving beyond that to actually include the effects of degeneracy on all of the physical structures. Okay, so to actually model the thermal pressures, we adopt a Fermi liquid theory based approach in which, in the degenerate regime, the thermal pressure is now given by the density, the temperature, and additionally, derivatives of the level, dense, the level density parameter, which in turn just depends on the Fermi momentum of the particles as well as the particle effective mass. And so, in order to parameterize the thermal pressure in this degenerate regime, we introduce the parameterization at the level of the particle effective mass function. Because here we can take advantage of the asymptotic behavior of what this effective mass function looks like. So at very low density, the effective mass function just approaches the vacuum rest mass of the particles. And at higher densities, the effective mass function should be okay, but then sort of pairs with the power law is okay, at least within the uh, uh, calculations that we're considering here. And so we find that this can be well approximated with just a two parameter approximation uh, based on a density transition parameter, which is roughly related to the density at which particle interactions start to become important in the matter. And a power logic K parameter, which is roughly related um, to the, the strength of the interactions within the matter. And we find that with this two parameter model for the effective mass function, we're able to capture this density dependence of the thermal pressure at very high densities um, and recover uh, a complete model for the thermal pressure across many orders of magnitude and density, um, and also for the various temperatures you might expect to encounter in a merger simulation. Just, just yes. Down here. yes. It was a sharp transition here. From something that I was able to follow to something that I'm not. No yes, this is okay. This is the most technical side. So please what go ahead. Mass, uh, what's the physical meaning of this effective mass? It's a mass of. Uh, this is the, part of the particle effective mass. So we're treating neutrons and protons in this approximation uh, equivalently. Um, there are small corrections if you wanted to treat the, the, the neutron proton mass difference, but we're neglecting that here. And so this is just the, the effective mass. So at low density, um, when you don't have degeneracy in the matter, the effective mass function is just 939 MeV. And at higher densities, um, as some of the energy in the system goes into the interactions between the particles, you, you get this deviation away. I'm sorry? What is behind this shock drop physically? Why does it happen? Uh, just due, due to the degeneracy setting into the matter. <laughs> right. So, uh, are there yeah, yeah. the compressibility negative? So you have a two phase coexistence there on the right. You're getting compressibility negative in a small region there. You see the curvature changing? Yes. You mean the fact that this is negative? So the overall pressure function is always monotonically increasing. This is just the thermal part of the pressure. So the overall pressure is always increasing. You see that the, the decrease here is the transition from the um, so non relative pressure is this overall pressure as opposed to this. What is this? This is the temperature dependent. This is just, yeah. So if you have your total pressure and you subtract off the zero temperature part, the temperature this is what left over. Is yeah, the, the total pressure is monotonically yeah. increasing. Uh, yes. From usually in, in Fermi liquid theory, the effective mass that you get is makes the particles heavier because they Area of rest, um, rest that they become dressed by the particles. And, uh, it, it is and this would mean that the Fermi velocity is actually becoming faster rather than slower. Is, is there a good way to understand that? And actually, in Fermi equal theory, as far as I'm, it doesn't have anything to do with degeneracy, it has to do with interactions. Because if I have no interactions, there is effective mass is just the mass. Um, yes, yes, yes. And, and usually, because of interactions, you have become larger and larger effective mass and the quasi-particle weight just reduce accordingly. Uh, so what, what makes the mass smaller here? I, I don't think it, it's forbidden, but it's weird. Um, Maybe it's because of the liquid or something. I mean, I think it might just be the relativistic effects. I'm not, I'm not very sure, uh, I guess. Uh, so these 
The function I'm showing here are based on a set of relativistic mean field theory calculations. Um, I will emphasize that this is the effective mass function um, without the Fermi momentum added in. So if you add the Fermi momentum mass in, it will start to decrease to some point, and then it will start to increase again at higher densities. So you would never reach these very low values. Um, but you do in all of these relativistic mean field theory calculations, at least in the context of these neutron star equations of state that I'm familiar with, you, you do need to be square. Um, the interactions are the strong interactions, nuclear interactions? Yes. Um, okay, so uh, I would be curious to chat more afterwards, but maybe for now I will move on if that's okay, unless there are other questions about this. Um, I, I know I, I went through this fast and I was just going to try and uh, quickly summarize and get to some uh, simulation results. But uh, the, the key takeaway here, um, subject maybe to some of these outstanding questions, is that at least for the context of these neutron star merger equations of state, um, the finite temperature part of the equation of state can be captured with a, a simple approximation of the particle effective mass. So this is the relativistic effective mass. Um, and we can now use this to start to explore the uncertainties in the finite temperature part of the equation of state. And um, so I'm now going to show some, some simulation results where we've tried to actually explore these, these uncertainties systematically. Um, and so the, the basic premise behind these is that we're going to uh, launch a series of neutron star merger simulations, all of which are governed by the same uh, initial data. So they are initially governed by the same zero temperature equation of state which is consistent with the, the constraints that I showed you in the first part of the talk, latest astrophysical constraints. To each of these cold equations of state, we paint on a different thermal prescription corresponding to a different set of these effective mass parameters. Um, and these were chosen to try to bracket the range of uncertainty um, in the finite temperature part of the equation of state that's spanned by these relativistic mean field theory models that I showed you before. Um, and so here, of course, the goal now is to try to track through how the uncertainties in the finite temperature part of the equation are going to influence the, the dynamics of the post merge revolution independently from the differences in the cold state. So this is going to play uh, 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 the actual uh, movie of, of what the simulations look like. So on the left, you're going to see the mass distribution of the two neutron stars as they merge together. And on the right, it's going to show you the thermal pressure relative to the cold pressure, where it's normalized in the swing, so you can tell when the um, thermal pressure starts to become uh, a significant fraction of the cold pressure. This is when you might expect the, the effect of the finite temperature physics to start to become significant. Um, and I want to emphasize I'm only showing here matter that's uh, above a few percent of nuclear density. So this is just high density matter. I'll go ahead and let it play. It's a little glitchy because of Zoom, but basically what you see is that the neutron stars start at zero temperature by construction, um, and they basically remain cold up until the they come into contact with one another. I'll play the first few frames back again so you can see um, that uh, heating developing at this interface between the two neutron stars. Um, and by the end of the evolution, which lasts 20 seconds after merger, you can see the, the matter sort of distributes and you get thermal pressure that's a significant fraction of the cold pressure at quite high densities within the neutron star interior. So this is with one set of these um, effective mass parameters, one thermal prescription basically for modeling the equation of state, finite temperature part of the equation of state. We can also now compare across our different sequences uh, of different thermal prescriptions. Um, and I'll go ahead and just show all these results together. Um, so these are again late time equatorial snapshots from the end of the simulation, about 20 months and back from where it And so here you can start to see that based on what you prescribe for this effective mass function, uh, you start to see some qualitative differences in the thermal profile of the late time merger. Um, for example, this power law decay parameter alpha seems to most directly govern uh, the strength of the temperature in the innermost core region of this massive neutron star remnant. Uh, and so this is really uh, uh, kind of a first look at how the uncertainties in the finite temperature part of the equation of state when it comes to universal density dependence are mapping to different thermal structures in the post-merger uh, neutron star remnant. Of course, um, these are just spatial places. It can also be informative to look at how uh, these quantities vary as a function of the density. So this is now just showing the median thermal pressure and temperature as a function of the density. Um, 
uh, for those of you demonstrate the same snapshots I showed you on the previous slide. And so here you can see that for all of these different simulations, with thermal pressure, the significant fraction of the cold pressure to quite high density. So we find that the thermal pressure exceeds 10% of the cold pressure at densities of up to around three times nuclear densities. Additionally, we see factors of maybe three to five times difference in the thermal pressure support that is provided, um, depending on what you assume for this thermal prescription um, for the effective mass parameters. Likewise, we see some uh, differences in, in the temperature profiles around 30 to 50 percent um, in the peak temperatures that are reached for the dense matter interior, depending on what parameters you adopt. Um, and it might seem somewhat redundant to look at thermal pressure and temperature uh, independently. Of course, these are derived quantities from one another, but they're giving us different insight into different physical processes uh, within the merger remnant and potentially different observable properties. So, for example, Having more or less thermal pressure is going to potentially influence the oxidation of the post merger remnant, um, which can have implications for the post merger gravitational wave emission. This also may influence, of course, how long the remnant object can survive against gravitational collapse to a black hole, where the temperatures are going to more directly shiver and oxide. Properties like the neutrino emissivity, um, which has implications for the eventual cooling or neutrino radiation of the disk, um, which, of course, is going to influence the electromagnetic counterpart on, on longer time scales than we're seeing here. Yes. How different are the maximum masses allowed given by those different thermal profiles? Um, you're saying if we just uh, prescribed the, the yeah. thermal profiles or the status to reduce them, yeah. the maximum masses. I haven't done that calculation. We do see that for this range of thermal profiles, um, depending on what mass you initialize the neutron stars with, you can sometimes get uh, a delayed collapse prior to the end of the simulation for some of these and not for others. So it can, it, we have some preliminary evidence that it, it can push um, around the maximum maximum. I don't know specifically for this thermal profile what the TOD. Can I ask which direction that goes? Because I could see two, two effects of, you know, the, the, the thermal energy, because for Einstein is also mass. Mm -hmm. So the gravity is larger because it's hot, but at the same time, it's providing pressures. So I guess I'm just curious in terms of stability is it that adding these thermal effects making it more stable or less stable? I would say that is a question I hope to have an answer for you in another okay. month or two. Okay. Right. But uh, maybe I, I will just say that I think it has an effect right now, and we're quantifying kind of okay. what the, the exact effect will be. Okay. So, uh, I do want to show you what the actual post merger gravitational wave emission looks like since I printed that right now uh, for some time. So, these are the gravitational wave streams that we extract from these four different sets of simulations. Um, as you can see, uh, the in scale gravitational waves are identical for all four sets of these simulations, which is exactly what we would expect given that um, these simulations were launched from identical initial data and the neutron stars are all governed by the same zero temperature equation. And as you saw, the matter remained cold basically prior to merging. But after merger, where we have this heating developing, we see differences in the post-merger gravitational waves, both in terms of the amplitude and then the sort of decaying deep frequency of, of these post-merger gravitational waves. And so uh, this hints at there being a potentially subtle signature of these effective mass parameters on the post-merger gravitational waves, uh, which I think is a really exciting prospect because this is mimics that you cannot access through observation of this is only accessible through observations of this, this hot, muscle post merger environment. Um, the exact magnitude of this effect is something I'll come back to at the very end of my talk if I have time. Um, we're currently following up on this study uh, with additional cold equations of states to sort of generalize these results. And I'll, I'll come back to this at the end. Um, I'll say for now that it seems like this might be a, a somewhat subtle effect in terms of the actual uh, detectability. Um, but I do want to shift gears now. Um, so the last part of my talk, um, which is focused now on how we can use a, a detection of these post-merger gravitational waves more generally to probe the structure of the post-merger remnant um, and how we can then relate this back to the, the underlying equation. Yeah. Just a quick question on the last slide. So yeah. maybe you were starting to address that, but do you know if these differences are detectable using the different yeah. templates that people have? I mean, there's only a certain sensitivity that they have on the template matching. Uh, yes. So, so the template matching. Um, well, they have detection fast merger. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have not really detected any of these higher frequency gravitational. Right, I mean, if you plug them into the template matching algorithms, whether they can detect the difference between those signals. Uh, for these signals, it will probably be very challenging. I'll come back to the, the numbers at, at the end of the talk. I want to introduce the, uh, some uh, other results to give some context for what these numbers are going to be first. Um, and if I don't answer the question, I'll come back to that. So just, just to conclude, well, is it correct that the existing observations of gravitational waves, they have only signal up to merger? Yes. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. Everything that has been detected so far has been up until merger. This is all sort of future looking what we might be able to detect with these. Okay, um, so I, I've shown you now a few times what the gravitational wave stream looks like as a function of time. Um, one of the main goals for detecting these higher frequency post merger gravitational waves um, it is to perform astro seismology on the maximum transfer remnant to try and determine it. Um, and so we do this, we basically, we, we compute the power spectrum of these post merger gravitational waves. And you get spectra that look like what you see here on the wave, where there are distinct spectral peaks. Um, and these spectral peaks have been correlated with different oscillation modes of this massive neutron star remnant. I want to focus in particular on this loudest spectral peak, which is here labeled S2. This is a feature that is um, present in virtually every uh, simulation of binary neutron star mergers that is performed. Um, and it's, thought, it's been shown to be core, uh, powered by uh, the quadrupolar oscillation modes of the remnant. So these are driven by the L equals N equal to modes of the remnant. And it's been shown that if you repeat this entire merger simulation and just swap out for a different equation of state, the effect is to shift this F2 peak frequency to the left or to the right. Um, and it turns out it does so not randomly, but that there are strong correlations between the location of this peak frequency F2 and different properties of the neutron star equation of state. And so I'm going to focus in particular on the, the, the these are called quasi-universal relations between this peak frequency F2 and the neutron star radius, which again is an intrinsic property predicted by the whole neutron star equation of state. Uh, and these quasi-universal relations have uh, been, were first introduced in the early 2010s by uh, Andreas Spassman and Nicholas Ter Euler, um, and they've been developed with a large number of numerical simulations over the last decade since. This figure is from a recent meta-analysis of over 100 different numerical relativity simulations, uh, where each point in this figure corresponds to one equation of state and one set of binary masses that were merged in, in the merger. And you can see that basically all of these different points map out a, a unique plane through this space. And if you fix the masses of this system, which you may expect you could reasonably constrain from in spiral gravitational waves by the time you actually are making a detection of these post merger gravitational waves, you get uh, a collapsed version of this relationship, like what's shown on the figure on the right here, where this gives you effectively a one to one mapping between the peak frequency of the post merger gravitational waves and the neutron star radius with some small degree of scatter. Now, having a one to one mapping like this is an incredibly powerful result because to the degree that we have characterized the scatter of this relationship, this enables us to take a future detection of these post major gravitational waves, say if LIGO tells us that it's three kilohertz, we can use this relationship then to directly map that to constraints on the neutron star radius being between, say, in this case, 12 and 12 and a half kilometers. And then we can now combine those results with all of the types of constraints I showed you in the first part of this talk from X-ray radius observations or from tidal deformability constraints. Um, and we can have a self, basically a self-consistent framework for analyzing uh, what this equation of state information gives us. Now, there has been one way in which these quasi-universal relations have been shown to be violated. This was uh, pointed out in a paper in 2019 by Andreas Bauswein, that if your equation of state has a first order phase transition in the matter um, to some state of, say, deconfined quark matter in the interior, such an equation of state would systematically violate these existing quasi-universal relations. And so it's conjectured in that work that if you see uh, an observation that falls off of this band of quasi-universality, um, that this would be a smoking gun indicator of a first order phase transition in the neutron star matter, um, which would be a really exciting prospect to actually be able to, to infer this. So um, in the last few minutes of my talk, I want to talk about some recent work that I've done together with Elias Most, who's here in the audience, um, exploring some extreme equations of state in the context of merger simulations 
to sort of add to the calibration of these quasi-universal relations and to try to characterize exactly under what conditions do these quasi-universal relations <coughs> exist. And so to that end, we constructed a large family of phenomenological equation of state models for the experts in the audience. These are just piece by polytropic equations of state. Um, so each of these curves, and I'm showing you just the mass radius relations, each of these curves corresponds to one different equation of state model. We constructed these models uh, so that we would have sequences of equations of state that predict common features for intermediate mass neutron stars. So for example, the radius of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star is held the same uh, for all three of these different models. But you can see they have very different behaviors at higher masses. Um, so the, the points here are color coded by a parameter that uh, gives you the ratio of the radius of a low mass neutron star to the radius of a high mass neutron star. You can think of this as being related to the slope of this mass radius relation. And to give you a sense of why these different types of phenomenological features might be interesting to explore, um, basically, if you have uh, an equation of state that predicts a larger radius at high masses. This is what would happen if your equation of state has a significant stiffening in the pressure function at high densities. Um, so this can be caused, be caused, for example, by some exotic and phase transitions, for example, or phase transitions in state of postionic matter. In contrast, the models that have a, a smaller neutron star radius at high masses are what you would expect to see if you have a softening in your equation of state, the pressure function at high densities, like what you might expect to have if you have some sort of crossover phase transition. Or in the more extreme case, like what was simulated in the Bowswing paper I referenced on the previous slide, um, in the case of a first order phase transition. So we performed simulations for each of these states. Crucially, we had the finite temperature part of the equation of state fit in the framework that I described in uh, my talk to make sure that we're uh, focusing in just on the uncertainties on the cold part of the equation of state. We don't have to worry about these additional uncertainties from the finite temperature for there. Uh, I'm going to skip that because we're running low on time. Uh, and I'll just show you these are the graphics, so a subset of the gravitational wave signals um, that we extracted from these different simulations. And so you, I'm going to try and focus the attention in here. If you focus on a, a subset of models that have the same characteristic neutron star uh, radius uh, of 12 kilometers for an intermediate mass neutron star, what you can see here is that already by eye, there's a significant difference in the post-merger gravitational waves, depending on what's happening in the mass radius relation at higher density, at higher masses, or equivalent in the position at higher densities. So, right, what we're seeing here is that there seems to be some additional frequency to take into account because these models have the same characteristic radius for very different oscillation frequencies. And so we computed the, the spectrum for all of these, calculated, extracted that dominant spectral peak of two for every one of these simulations. Um, and here's the plot that compares what we find from these extreme equations of state compared to the existing quasi-universal relation. And the first thing I want to emphasize here is that we're finding results that are broadly consistent with what they find. Generally, this peak frequency F2 correlates roughly with the characteristic radius of the neutron star equation of state. Um, however, we're finding that with this large family of equations of state models, we're seeing somewhat larger scatter than had previously been reported. And I think most interestingly here, we can see by eye that the scatter, at least for this model, family of equation of state models that we've constructed, can be well explained um, by the slope parameter. By basically what's happening in the equation of state at higher densities. And so in our paper, we show that there's uh, for this family of equation of state models at least, there seems to be strong statistical evidence in favor of adding in a second parameter to this quasi-universal relation that depends on the slope of the mass radius relation. And so this is telling us is that these post-merger gravitational waves are maybe probing um, simultaneously some combination of the characteristic neutral slope radius and the leading order slope of the mass radius relation. More generally, what this is telling us is that the peak frequency of these post-merger gravitational waves are probing matter at slightly higher densities than could be considered if you just wanted to correlate S2 with the radius of the intermediate masses. We have to take into account the higher density physics in order to uh, fully interpret uh, the, these uh, peak frequency promoted gravitational waves. And so I think that this leaves us in an exciting possibility that if we were to detect a future neutron star merger event from head to tail, basically, from the in-spiral through the post-merger phase of these gravitational waves, um, you could, in principle, constrain the equation of state actually across a range of densities. 
Um, and so uh, I'm coming up on the top of the hour. I just have two summary slides to sort of wrap up. Um, but I want to sort of summarize the different equation of sacred tendencies <clears throat> versus gravitational waves um, that I have mentioned that I spent half of my talk. Um, sort of in a, an order of uh, how big the equation of state effect is on the post gravitational gravitational wave. And if you reverse that statement around, this also tells us, of course, um, how well we'll be able to constrain different parameters right, with our future detection. So the dominant effect uh, signature of the equation of state on the post gravitational waves comes from the characteristic neutron star radius. As you can see, by changing the neutron star radius uh, that's predicted by your equation of state by a few kilometers, you can shift this peak frequency by on the order of a thousand hertz. There's one a second order correction term that seems to be related to what's happening to neutron stars at higher masses or at higher densities in the equation of state, which can additionally have a secondary effect of shifting the peak frequency by a few hundred hertz. Um, and then after that, we additionally have the effect of changing the signal description, which we're currently um, expanding on the results that I showed you um, with some follow up work. Um, extending those parameter study results to additional cold equations of state. And what we're finding is that uh, across different cold equations of state, we still do see some signature of the effective mass parameters influencing these post merger gravitational waves, so the thermal prescription influencing the post merger gravitational waves, but that this is maybe at a, a smaller uh, level of around 100 hertz or so. So this will be challenging to detect compared to all of these larger uncertainties in the cold physics. Um, for now, it's maybe just an extra uncertainty that we have to take into account. Um, but in the future, if we were able to pin down these uncertainties very well, um, we might be able to detect um, on the future. Um, and so I'll just conclude by saying, uh, uh, as someone I think clarified a few slides ago, we have not yet detected these post measure gravitational waves. Um, our prospects for doing these in the coming years, um, we have sort of three ways forward. One, maybe we'll get very lucky and have a very nearby event, but this would have to be much closer than the first neutron star merger event, which was already very lucky. Our second way forward is maybe we can be very clever by stacking sub threshold uh, events, um, building up statistics. We might be able to make some progress there if we still have some relatively close by events. Um, and the third option is, of course, we have to be a little bit patient. So the next generation of gravitational wave detectors that are currently being proposed, uh, we're going to be a full order of magnitude more sensitive position to the current and two proposed detectors. Um, a full order of magnitude more sensitive. Uh, and hopefully uh, these will detect uh, the post measure gravitational waves very readily, um, although this might not be until the 2030s. So uh, with that, I'll just put up my summary slide. I'm already at the end of the hour um, and happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the very exciting report. Uh, I have a question. You haven't said anything about the collapse of the results in the star into a black hole. You, do your calculations uh, predict that moment? And where is that? Is that because you had this oscillations all the way to the end of the simulation? Yeah. Is the collapse happening inside of it, outside? So, um, in all the simulations we did here, um, we still, we were using not quite so massive stars so that we would have a long post merger phase so that we could study these matter effects in the post merger phase. Um, for the thermal studies that I showed you, I think um, the remnant mass was above like the Kepler sequence mass, so that what you could support just by um, rotation within a TOV cold equation of state. So these objects are being supported by some combination of differential rotation and thermal support. They will collapse on some time scale, but this will be much longer than what we're simulating. Um, and you would also have to uh, include, for example, cool instance or something to, to actually accurately capture that on, on these longer time scales. <coughs> in principle, the numerical method that you're using is capable of, it's, you're solving Einstein equations. So yes. So it's capable of kind of, of capturing that, yeah. That, right? yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, if, if you, but you right, would need to make sure you're including all the physics for capturing the angular momentum transport that may involve the spin down or the cooling um, on these longer time scales. And additionally, these things might <coughs> for a second or longer, at which point the numerical relativity simulations are computationally infeasible. So not but you would hand it off um, to, to some of them. Okay, I'll go in order of increasing distance. <laughs> so, maybe you showed various periodic phases that could. In the core, like 
super um, fluidity or superconductivity of um, and and people in science phases and so on. So, but in other things, because you're at um, you know very weak coupling, presumably there is a very small gap. So, uh, and the equation of space would not would it be sensitive enough to distinguish between these different phases or and actually what you used is a Fermi liquid which makes sense a Fermi liquid uh, model which doesn't care about what's really the low temperature phase that emerges because maybe that's too fine detailed uh, so would you be able to merge um, yeah so it's so I mean that that is the key question if we're going to be able to teleport these these different theoretical predictions for the equation of space. So that, that, that's your model, it, they don't even, you know, in your model doesn't include these phases, right? It's just the, the second model for thermal liquid with different parameters. And the thermal physics, yes, absolutely. The, no, the, the no, thermal no. prescription no. is assuming NPE matter. It's it's just uh, exploring the uncertainties in that part of the equation of space, parameter mm -hmm. space. Yes. The, uh, there are other uh, equations of state, but uh, so if you look at equals zero, then basically the most important part of the equation of state is just the compressibility, am I right? Because uh, and, and then the compressibility between a superconductor and a normal state, if delta is small, maybe is is, is the difference is delta over yes squared. So okay, so so for the, the, the superconducting. Uh, yeah. aspect of it that is not being considered in any of these yeah. simulations or these equations of state models. But the, the sure. equations of state more generally are, yeah. The temperature is so high in the merger that the superconducting phase disappears. You, you will lose the superconducting phase absolutely at merger basically because so you're in tens of energy. I'm yeah. sorry? So, but there are other interesting phases that would remain, you say? Uh, so, so, so these different predictions that I mentioned, I think yeah. also okay. for like deconfined quark matter or some hyperonic phasor matter, mm -hmm. some those Einstein condensates, those all have different um, pressure profiles okay. that they would predict for the neutron star remnants. And so part of what we're trying to understand is how those different pressure profiles would map. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's at, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, that would be afterwards. There were a few questions there. So keep, please your, keep your hand raised. What is the actual amplitude of these oscillations, like in fractional radius perturbation? Ah, that's an excellent question. I don't have that number off of the top of my head. Um, I'm not, yeah, I don't have that. They look, I mean, the fact that the gravitational wave signal is not all that different from the merger signal means they're pretty big. And so I guess I wonder very large amplitude oscillations tend to nonlinearly decay by coupling to other modes. So I just, I, I mean, and some of that can be captured in simulations and some can't because it's coupling to higher order modes that aren't resolved. Right. That's a good question. I don't, I don't. Yeah, several kilometers. Yeah, that's what it seems like it has. Yeah, like it has this gravitational light curve mm -hmm. will develop not only by using gravitational waves, but also mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I'm wondering whether, whether there's other additional instant hydrodynamics that could be a flavor. Yes, I mean, also, I, I focus just on this one spectral feature, but there are other spectral features which are caused by some quasi radial oscillations, and there's coupling between the modes and n equals one modes that you would also explore. Um, but yes, there are other things I want to talk about. That seems very bad. Yeah. Um, didn't give us very much information about what actually happens if the neutron stars merge together. And in particular, I'd, I'd like to know what the current model state about the event horizon and how it evolves continuously as the merger continues and how that affects your equations of state once matter is inside the uh, event horizon. If it's a gradual evolution, how does it, what's your picture of that? I... Well, I mean, so, so, I mean, for all these neutron stars, right, we are not collapsing to black holes on, on these time scales. So, so we are outside of the event horizon right there. Uh, uh, so, so it remains constantly, in this picture, it doesn't become a black hole. As right. it scale. Do they ever become black holes? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I do merge two slightly larger mass neutron stars than what I showed here. 
you can get basically different outcomes. So one outcome would be if the initial neutron stars were very massive, as they merge, you can get a prompt collapse to a black hole. Um, so as, as the matter comes together, has any, any form of black hole. Um, there can also be sort of delayed collapses to a black hole that you might resolve on the tens of milliseconds time scales that we're evolving here. Um, but everything that I showed today, these all remain neutron stars to the end of our simulation. Thank you. Derek, you had a question? Yeah, so I'm wondering, I really like this idea of using multiple different lines of evidence to understand what sorts of neutron star radii are allowed by certain equations of state. And I'm wondering, since you talked about the, the sort of in-spiral diagnostics and X-ray diagnostics, really kind of probing more of this cold equation of state, if you want, or equilibrium equation of state, and then moving away from that, how long does it take for the merge system to settle back down to a place where we might reasonably compare it back to those other metrics again? Uh, is it in that disequilibrium for a long time? Does it? Yeah, so so the cooling time scale becomes relevant on like, um, like a second or longer is when you start to have cooling effects. Um, for it to cool completely, I don't know exactly what that time scale would be. Um, right, uh, and and the, the basically like the spin down uh, time scale of, of these systems is maybe like 100 seconds or something. So like after that phase, you can have some more. So just follow up quickly then, if you have a radius that you measure using these very cool like F2 techniques, do you, do you still consider that to be a reasonable thing to compare to the into the pre-merger radii? Okay, so yeah, so right, this is this is not the radius of the remnant object. This is uh, an, uh, just the unique prediction of the equation of, of the zero temperature equation of state for non-rotating static uh, models. So we're just correlating what this F2 value is that we extract from our simulations with this parameter that is predicted by the equations of state, but not actually extracted from the simulations. Does that make sense? Does that I think so, yes. clarify? So, so we're correlating this with a, a property that is determined by the cold equilibrium equation of state. So the degree to which that is valid depends on the degree to which we have these additional uncertainties from the finite temperature physics. For this figure, it was a green health constant. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are the students who talked about the from gravitational wave signal, and I wonder, are there any equally promising constraints you could get from an electromagnetic counterpart? Yeah, so I think uh, there is absolutely interesting information from the magnetic counterpart. Some people have um, set a lower limit on what the tidal deformability could be based on what the is, not information. We might eject more material, and this will change the features of the electromagnetic counterpart. So that's one way forward. This requires calibration to lots of numerical simulations, which are subject to all the kinds of uncertainties that I mentioned in the equation state of simulations. So that's one way forward. Additionally, having the electromagnetic counterpart, of course, maybe gives us some information about the threshold mass to collapse, um, which is very exciting. For 170817, as you probably know, having the EM counterpart um, helps get better constraints on the tidal deformability because it pinned down the localization so well. And so when they redid the analysis, they were able to fix the, um, the, di I can go to the distance to the source, and that gave us better constraints on the tidal deformability as well. Just to follow up on Daryl's question, I mean, so we were talking about time scale to cool back down to like uh, t equals zero uh, equation of state or whatever, but is there any scenario where you would merge two neutron stars and then end up at something that's not a black hole? Like, yeah, so they would have to be very low mass neutron stars. Um, you lose maybe a few tenths of solar mass in gravitational radiation. Um, but right, if the maximum mass of the neutron stars is 2.2 solar masses, you know, the, the merging objects have to be like 1.1 or maybe 1.2 solar masses for, the, for that to work out and for it to survive forever as a, a massive neutron, a neutron star remnant. Um, in principle, this might happen because there, there are no other neutron stars with masses down to about 1.1 solar masses, but the merger rates would be very Post merger, you had a slow envelope frequency or more than one. Does one qualitatively understand what is what is that? This was yeah, so, so these, these oscillation modes 
there was this enveloped frequency on a different scale. And what was this qualitatively? So, um, okay. So, yeah, so, so the, we'll just say that these, these are being driven by the different oscillation modes of the remnant. The dominant effect is going to be these quadrupolar oscillation modes as this object is, is uh, oscillating, or they're going to drive part of these oscillations, but there's additional um, modes due to other. Uh, they have not been clarified uh, distinctly. The, the fundamental. So, so they are, but uh, when we look, at, they're clarified uh, more directly when we look at the, the, the spectrum and identify distinct spectral features. And then these have been correlated with different oscillation modes of the remnant, and that mapping is, uh, at least for some of these, uh, fairly well understood. Um, I don't have a good answer for exactly which envelope maps to which spectral feature, though I, I, I don't, I would have to check on this specifically. Ryan, I guess I was curious about what you would consider compelling evidence for a phase transition. I was specifically thinking like, you, know, you, you emphasize this radius growing with the mass. You know, thanks to 190425, we know there are massive neutron stars. So we're going to get some, hopefully, unless that was a complete fluke, we're going to get some high deformability for mm -hmm. more massive neutron stars as well as the 1.4. Do you think that the evidence will come from that kind of measurement across multiple uh, radii across multiple masses? Uh, come from this kind of measurement? I'm just curious what your thoughts are as to whether we'll be able to make. Really a compelling case, or are there other ways to wiggle out of this if we saw that? Yeah, I think for the title, there are good prospects for doing this with the title of vulnerability and principal engineer. Um, basically, it has been shown in the case, um, subject to some bit, right? Between the title of vulnerability that measure and the neutron star radius, um, you would basically violate that when we're mapping again if you have a a associated with the transition and neutron star equation of state. Um, and so I, I think doing this on a, a population level might be possible um, with either O5 or you know, next generation of facilities when we detect 10,000 of these binary neutron star mergers, that we might be able to disentangle subpopulations of stars that basically have similar masses but very different types of formabilities. Um, and, and I think that would be uh, a strong indicator of a first order phase transition. Um, so this continuity in the MR really. Yeah, effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether there are other ways to wiggle out of it to within this, you know, statistical uncertainties that we have, this will always be the challenge. But um, I think that would be pretty compelling. Yeah. Um, just to go back to nuclear physics. <laughs> You had a you had a slide where you had this very nice uh, diagram of the nuclear equation of state. If you, if you go back to that, could you just sketch the trajectory of this most merger system through that diagram, through that phase uh, phase diagram? Uh, like which uh, so a nuclear a, a merger, which um, part it traces, right? Does it build in time? Even the temperature density, right? Right, right. yes, the temperature density, yeah. which also had a little third direction. It's one of the one at the very beginning. No, no, that, no, the one that shows different phases of matter. Yeah. And there was a, a little, like, or, uh, you mean at, at the very beginning? Yeah, yeah. The, the, that, that, that's what that, that's the right. So, okay, great. yeah, so how, how does it fly? Yeah, so we start cold, zero temperature. Uh, very, very neutron rich um, and high densities, maybe four times nuclear densities for the types of systems that are three or four times nuclear densities for the systems that are considering. As they emerge, you get rapid heating at their merger. Um, and so you move, I'll, I'll use my hands. So which, which, possible, which possible conjecture phases does uh, that control? Uh, well, I, that, that is very much the, the question of the day. Uh, is which of these phases we're going to be probing. But in principle, we're going from this region to higher temperatures, potentially changing equilibrium composition as well uh, to, to non equilibrium composition. Um, and whether or not we achieve these color superconducting phases, this is 
where the, the work is being done to try and understand um, what is possible and what these different um, phases would, what kind of signature that would lead to in the merger. Okay, with that, um, it's been Caroline.